why smart people hurt. I'm back with Dr. Matt Zakreski. You got it right today too. Good. <laughs> right out of the gate without asking again. And we're back because in episode one, in part one of why smart people hurt, we ran out of time. Yeah. And there's more to cover. And so Matt has so graciously offered to come back for another time with me. And um, he even has a new baby on the way a few days from now. So he's got a lot going on and he's still taking his time out to finish our conversation about why smart people hurt. So if you well, haven't listened. You that awesome. That's, I mean, you know. That. Uh, thank you. If you haven't listened to the first part, you may want to do that because you'll learn a little bit more about Matt and a little bit more about where he comes from and the other questions I ask him and the stories he tells really set the stage. And so we're going to continue knowing that we've talked about things already like procrastination and having confidence and different things of the reasons why smart people hurt, including having meaning and having a sense of community. So those are some of the topics, not all of them, that we cover on part one. So this is part two, and we're going to move forward with some other questions. And of course, because I'm an intuitive, I am going with my intuition. I have some ideas, and Matt has no idea where I'm going. So that is the fun of this podcast, because, <laughs> because we can be in the moment and in the flow, knowing that it's important to know that someone gets you, mm -hmm. and we get you. And Matt gets me, and I get Matt. And when there's a connection that way and understand each other, everything changes. So Matt, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much for coming back. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm so excited about this. I, I, you know, I mean, like, what a treat. I'm so happy to be here. Oh, this is great. So what I want to talk about first, mm -hmm. and it's where I was headed when we ended up having to, to finish the first part, is overthinking yeah. and overcommitting. Like saying yes way beyond just because we can and then we get ourselves burned out or overthinking every little thing and then burning ourselves out. Yes. And it's so common. And even it's even common and people don't call themselves gifted, even though I could argue that they are and they just don't see it yet. Mm -hmm. And what are your thoughts about this whole overthinking, overcommitting thing? And, and what would you say to the person who's struggling with that? I mean, I personally know people who are um, kind of burning themselves out that way. And I do a Facebook Live every day. And there's a lot of people on there that today I was talking about overcommitting. And they were saying, I'm guilty of that. I do that. I do that. And so I think it's a bigger issue than even I realize. So what are your thoughts on that? And what solutions might you have? So, so when we talk about overcommitting, um, it's to me as a psychologist, right? I, I, I tend to see this as a as a, as every behavior comes from an emotional place, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And as someone who also struggles with overcommitting, right? It's, it's something that I have done some research on and looked at. And what it continuously comes down to me is this idea that, that people who overcommit are people who feel like love is something that they have to earn. Mm. That's love, a, it's a, love is something you have to earn. Mm -hmm. Listen. Write that down, you guys. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. It's even it's a painful thing to even say, right? Mm -hmm. Right. You know, I mean, love is something that should that is, right? That it just we get. But it's that when you get into this headspace, and love can mean any sort of thing, professional success, into social success, mm -hmm. popularity, love, sex, whatever that might be, right? Right. Say as long as I say yes, they'll love me. As long as I'm doing the thing, they'll love me. And the problem is, is that the world is never going to start, stop asking you for things. There's always another client. There's always another book to write. There's always another, someone who needs just five minutes of your time. And it's really 45 minutes, but it, it's, I swear it's just five minutes of, my, of your time. And, and what happens is that people, so there's the, there's this, there's this gap I talk about with my kids where what it's the thing that happens when you don't say no fast enough, what happens is, is the explosion. So if you think about it, like if someone asks you, Hey, do you want to blow up this balloon? If you say no, the balloon doesn't 
doesn't blow up. Well, that's good. But be, if you're afraid to say no because you're afraid people won't love you, you go up, you start blowing up the balloon, right? But because you don't want to do it, you end up blowing deeper and harder and faster until the balloon explodes. But because you never communicated that you didn't want to do it in the first place, the people in your environment all get mad at you. Why did you blow up the balloon? Why, what, what do you mean you're upset? You never told us you're upset. And then we feel shamed for expressing our feelings and say, I guess I shouldn't have said that we take the lesson as we shouldn't have said no in the first place. The lesson is that you should have said no, but you should have said no before it even started, right? What ends right. up happening is that we get, we get into these situations where we feel like we have to keep going and then we explode, melt down, whatever it ends up being. But because the environment doesn't know our backstory or the environment has an invested interest in ignoring that backstory, and unfortunately both situations exist, right. they only respond to our behavior and then consequences come to our behavior. They don't see the background. And you bring up a good point about the, the, vested, the, the vested interest of the environment not necessarily caring what the backstory is. And I think that's so important to really regain an internal locus of control and be acting upon the world instead of reacting to the world because the, in your balloon story or in any story people don't realize that that there's other ulterior motives and other agendas going on and if we're not operating from the inside out it it complicates all of those other scenarios yeah you know yeah that's that's so i love that balloon story it's so true <laughs> you yeah. know and so overthinking and overcommitting get in our way. Very what, much. what would be the antidote? Saying how we're feeling earlier first, or is there, is there more to it than that? Like if somebody's listening to you and they're the overcommitting type and they're going, well, that balloon story, that's kind of simple. There's much, yeah. much more going on. And, and, and I have the people that do, I have one question or if I just need five minutes and it's yeah. never five minutes and it's never, never one question. Five minutes. So that's how I had to learn it. But what, what, is there anything else that we could tell somebody? Or do you think that they just need to learn how to get their regulation and emotions and check a little earlier, which is always, you know, a goal? Yeah. So I'm going to pivot out of proper psychology into the self-help world for a moment, because the best explanation of this I've ever read is from Rachel Hollis. And she wrote, uh, girl, wash your face, and then girl, stop apologizing. And my wife read, girl, stop apologizing. And she said, you need to read this. And I said, okay, not, not my normal bedside reading, but I'll give it a shot, right? And it's, it, 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 it's a brilliant book. She has a million Instagram followers. She doesn't need me to, to plug her stuff. But there's this point in there that I kept returning to, that it's, if you're, if you're, response to an option isn't immediately, yes, oh my gosh, that's awesome, then the answer is no. And so it's like, mm -hmm. can I be on Diane's pop podcast? Yes, oh my gosh, that's awesome. And, and then somebody, somebody asked me if they could take 10 minutes of my time today to talk about a kid. And I said, you know what? No, I don't, I don't, it's Friday. I want to be done with work at four on Fridays and that's important to me, right? So the first thing is if your response to it isn't yes, right? Mm -hmm. Think about it like if you're single and you're listening to this, right? If someone asks you out for drinks, if your response isn't yes, oh my gosh, thank goodness this, per this very attractive person finally asked me out, then you probably should say no because you don't really wanna go. And then you're going to go and you're sort of beat, you're either going to beat yourself up for going or try to talk yourself into it. And neither of those things are, are a good outcome. So if the answer isn't a excited two thumbs up, yes, then, then you say no. The opportunity may wing back around. You don't, you never know, but it's okay to say no. And we say, we say no from a place of values. What are the things that matter to you, right? Mm -hmm. Family, friends, work, writing, running, walking your dog, playing with your kids, whatever those things are, those are the things that are, that, that, that guide our behavior. Those are our signposts. So to me, if an opportunity presents itself, it has to check at least three of my value areas for me to consider it, right? So 
talking to you is fun for me personally because I admire you and this is really cool. It's good for me <laughs> professionally because more people are going to know who I am and and listen, that and that's an okay reason to do something. Absolutely. Really, right? And then the third thing is that it's easier to say yes to this because my in-laws are here right now and they're watching my daughter. So actually my wife, who's very, very pregnant, is asleep and my in-laws are watching my two-year-old and this allows me to, to take an extra hour, right? Mm -hmm. And is, you know, so when I did my mental calculus yesterday was we were talking about doing episode two, I said, this checks those three boxes of personal values. So I can say yes to this, right? right? And that, and it's, it's empowering to make your decisions to, to use your words from the inside out. If you make decisions based on interpersonal values, you're going to feel better. You're going to do things with intention and you're setting yourself up for success. We do the work beforehand. So we're not constantly scrambling decided, is this something I actually want to do? You've already made the decision. Right. And when you're making the decision off your values and what's important to you, then the yes has more integrity and the no has more integrity. And then people respect you more in the long run because your yes means yes and your no means no. And there's none of that weird kind of chaotic or disingenuous or dysregulated energy or emotion, even if they can't identify it. You know, it, it makes mm -hmm. everything a lot more smooth and full of authenticity and integrity. And in the end, it's easier. I mean, learning how to do it in the beginning can be a little messy, but it's mm. messier doing all this other stuff, whatever it is. And, and um, yeah, and, and I think, I think your point is very valid. I think people sometimes think if they're not doing that, they're, they're not loved in whatever way that is. And, and it's, a, it's a wanting to be loved, even if it's an unconscious thing, or even if they don't really know that that's the thing. Right. I think, you know, when you said that, it rang really true. I'm like, yeah. Yeah. yeah when I've done that in the past, that's what I was looking for. Yeah. yeah and, I, and I know people, you know, like I could, it rang true. So that, that was really powerful. So gifted people, we're shifting a little here. Yeah. Gif, gifted people and people who have a lot of overexcitabilities and people who are visionaries tend to have sleep challenges. Yes. And, um, there's that old rule that, you know, we have to sleep eight hours a night in order to function. When I think the research now is saying more like seven, but, um, you know, I think it varies. So what do you say to, to your, especially the person who is, what I'm thinking about are the people who are like, if I don't get this much sleep, then, then it's going to be bad. And they set themselves up for this expectation that their body needs to sleep and rest like what everybody else is doing. And, the first rule of thumb is gifted people don't operate in that normal. So release right. those ideas. So what, what is your experience with this whole sleep thing? And is it important in, in that way to have it all be so rigid? Or what do you think is the most effective way for a visionary gifted person to really look at their sleep? So I, I think a lot about sleep. Um, like a lot of gifted people, I don't sleep well. I have a lot of trouble shutting my brain down. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to talk about this in the before, the during, and the after. Great. Okay. <laughs> so the before, establishing a sleep routine, right? I don't care if you start your sleep routine at 1 a.m., but start your, have a sleep routine. So for me, it's, I go upstairs, I brush my teeth, I, I actually, I do, push-ups. Um, I set a goal of trying to do 5,000 push-ups this year so I would be stronger for to help with delivery. Um, it's a random aside about me and I've, you know, it's been going very well. Um, and then I crawl into bed and I read whatever book it is I'm reading. And after about a half hour of that, right, I start to feel my body starting to slow down. So I, you know, I turn off the light and I go to bed. And I try to keep reading until my body tells me I'm tired. Having done this for a while, I know it's about a half hour, right? So I accept that from whenever I start reading to when I get tired is going to be about a half hour. So the first part of this is not to beat yourself up about when you start it. If you start your sleep routine at, at 1 a.m. and you do your, your hygiene stuff and it takes you 
10 minutes, right? Okay, is what 110, I'm gonna start reading for a half hour. Mm -hmm. And then at 140, 145 is when my eyes will be heavy and then I'll go to bed. You start when you start, right? The, one of my favorite lines is the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is right now. Right. Doesn't matter when you start. It just matters that you start. Right. Yep. So that's the before. Mm -hmm. The during is this thing where sleep should be used. Your bed should be used for sleeping and any adult activities that you get to get into. I don't know if this is a PG rated podcast. Uh, <laughs> um, and it's the sort of thing I, I share this because if you are laying there in bed and you are not sleeping, your brain is associating the stress of not sleeping with the place you're trying to sleep. Yes. And that's a bad thing because now you're sitting there angry at yourself that you're not sleeping mm -hmm. in the place that's supposed to be calming you down. So this is one of those things where I advise my clients to lose the battle to win the war. If you are lying there and tossing and turning for 20 minutes, the best thing to do is to get up out of bed and go to somewhere else in your house, an armchair, a couch, a, a place where you can read and relax. Um, no screens for this one. So this isn't like a get up and watch TV thing. This is a get up and read a book, read a magazine, if you have a, a Kindle that has the blue light feature, that's fine. But do something else for 20 to 30 minutes. That's about as long as a sleep cycle takes. So our bodies are going to re-regulate from that. And people will say to me, but Dr. Matt, like that's, I'm, lo I'm, I'm not in bed. I can't sleep if I'm not in bed. It's like, you're right. But you're not going to sleep tossing and turning in your bed and beating yourself up for it reset go somewhere else read for 20 to 30 minutes right once you start to feel your body getting tired again get up and try again right. and you're going to find that you're much more successful with that strategy because it's the sort of thing you know it's like the traffic jam metaphor if you're in a traffic jam there's nothing you can do about it right so you might as well stop beating yourself up about it and then if you can take another way take another way this is taking another way you go, you take a breast, you take a breath, you reset your brain. And then when you come back to bed in 30 minutes, you're going to find you're much more able to go to sleep. Finally, back end, when, once you wake up in the morning, the word that one of the most dangerous inventions in the world is the snooze alarm. It's a dangerous game, right? And it's the sort of thing I advise the people I work with to, if you're the sort of person who sets your snooze alarm, it sets your alarm for 8 a.m., but snoozes till 8.30, split the difference. Set your alarm for 8.30, 8.15, and promise yourself you aren't gonna hit your snooze. Because what the snooze does is it sends our body to this not really rested, not really awake state that is actually more stressful. So you're waking up with more stress, more cortisol in your, bo in your body, which is gonna make you feel groggier. When your alarm goes off, get up out of bed, you know, and take a shower, go start going for a run, feed your cat, whatever it is you do in the morning. But it's the sort of thing you can commit to yourself. When I wake up, I'm up, right? I'll give myself a little bit more time to sleep to, to accommodate that difference, but I'm not gonna push the five more minutes, five more minutes, five more minutes thing, because it's not actually helping you. It's, 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 it's giving a toll on your body that's gonna make waking up ultimately harder. So before, during, after. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And, and I um, I've struggled, used to struggle with that whole sleep alarm thing years and years ago, the, the snooze alarm. And then finally one day I'm like, this is ridiculous. I didn't know it was doing all that stress to my body at the time. And I'm like, I'm just going to set it. And that's just when I'm getting up. And it, there were moments back then, this is like 25 years ago, where I actually like rolled out of bed like, like I was going to fall out of bed to force myself to not hit the snooze button. Now I don't even think about it, but breaking that habit, I had to get kind of creative because people like brag about how many times they hit the snooze button. I'm saying, you're hurting yourself when you do that. You're harming your physiology when you do that, you know, live in the rhythm of your body. It's going to be okay. Yes. You know? And so that's, that's what I love that. When you're, I'm reminiscing as you're talking, <laughs> but so gifted people don't necessarily always sleep eight hours a night, right? No. No. Yeah. And, 
And whatever your amount of sleep is, if you're somebody who can run off four or five hours a night, more power to you, right? Two big thumbs up on that one. So, you know, I think the biggest thing is, is trying to set yourself up for that kind of success. If you're the sort of person who needs four or five hours of sleep, that's cool, but make sure you're getting them in a, in a setting that is going to set you up for success the day after, right? If you're someone who wants to sleep from 4 a.m. till 9 a.m., that's fine as long as your workplace slash family slash responsibilities aren't going to be impacted by that. Right. We do, you know, even as gifted kids, we do need to play by the rules of society, right? One of the kids I work with who has a lot of trouble sleeping, we set up, we set up his online school that he takes classes 2 p.m., 3 p.m., 4 p.m., which allows him to sleep from 4 or 5 in the morning till about noon, which is just what his body's telling him to do. And now we're not, fu- we're not going 10 rounds in the boxing ring to get him up in the morning to get to high school. We just steered into the skid and we set up his workplace and his work environment to accommodate that. And he's happier. His parents are happier. School's happier. Everybody wins, right? So much of, so many of the interventions when it comes to working with gifted visionary people in the world is about being creative yes, and seeing if we can adapt our responsibilities to fit the needs that we're bringing to the table. Right. Absolutely. Creativity is vital, you know, because visionary people, gifted people don't do the world the same way. So we have to realize that we have to be creative in how we're going to engage with it, whatever it is. So what about depression? That's, a, that's quite the segue. <laughs> I, um, I, I told you that I'm just going with my intuition. And, I, yep. and it's interesting because depression was not on my initial, I want to talk to Matt about it. Right. And after I was pondering and our conversation yesterday and I started thinking about it and I'm like, you know, there's a thing that, you know, I call, I don't know if it's the correct clinical word or not. Um, it used to be, but they changed the DSM so many times. I don't know, but the whole idea of agitated depression mm-hmm. where somebody looks like they're got all this energy or they're hyper ahead or they have ADD and they're agitated really, but it gets mislabeled and people miss the point that there's some kind of depression underneath it or some kind of emotional disconnection in some way. And I think it's more common, especially now, like with all the, all the problems going on in the world, all the change, all the transition, all the unknowns, all the existential crises. We don't know what's happening one day to the next. Right. And, and I think a lot of the agitation we're seeing from a lot of people is a form of agitated type depression in a way. And so I'm wondering, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are as far as looking into the future, like are there things, I'm sure that you have some good ideas about this, that people could start paying attention to so they don't get caught in that trap as all these things unfold? Yeah. Like, because I think even people who aren't um, necessarily prone to it could end up there if they're not really being attentive to what's, how, it's, how things are landing on them. Mm-hmm. So do you have thoughts about like the moving forward piece? Like how would that be? I mean, you have children, you know, you're a young person, you work with kids and what are some things we can do to not fall in those traps? Yeah. And it's, it, and it's hard, right? So I'm going to cite a study uh, that was from the wall street journal that came out um, about a month ago. And uh, they reported that the claiming of sick and vacation days had decreased over 80%, had increased over about 80% since quarantine started, which meant that, so people are working, right? We're working from home, but people stopped taking sick days. They stopped taking vacation days. Essentially, they stopped taking care of themselves because people like, well, we're at home, so I don't get to take a sick day. And it's like, yes, yes, you do. You are the most important commodity. You are the most important tool in your toolbox. Your colleagues, your clients, your kids, your partner, they depend on you. If your cup is empty, you cannot, you cannot pour into anybody else's cup. 
So one of the things as we moved from pre-quarantine world to quarantine world is we've lost three vital things. We've lost transition time. Mm -hmm. the, the idea of I get my commute to work to get my head on straight. I get my drive home to shift from being psychologist Dr. Matt to dad Dr. Matt. And, and, and all the little mini rituals of lunch breaks and coffee breaks that we used to do, and now we don't. So that there's that time that the barely minimal, barely passing self-care stuff we used to do disappeared. And what did we replace it with? More work. So the little self-care we did is gone and we replaced it with something <laughs> very challenging. So that's problematic. The second piece of this is this idea of, you know, well, if I won't do it, no one will. And a lot of, you know, we talked yesterday about the curse of competence, right? Right. And the problem with, if I won't do it, no one else will, is that you've set up a situation where no one will do it. If I hold on to all the things, I'm not letting anybody else do anything. I might feel like I'm the only competent person to do it. And maybe that's true, but that doesn't mean other people can't do it in the future. And we have to learn to tolerate the ramp up period for other people doing things. So one of the things that I've actually taken off my plate during quarantine is I have my two year old feed our cats. Now, she's not very good at it. She's two, fine motor skills are exactly where they're supposed to be, but they're pretty clumsy. But it's one, of the, it's one less thing I have to do and she loves it, right? So that is one less piece of mental strain I've got. And my two, and it's frankly, it's adorable. And she totters over and she puts the dry food in the thing. And then I don't have to do it anymore. So when I was in this mindset of, I must, I am the only person who can, I was burning myself out and I wasn't empowering anybody in my life to do those things. Mm -hmm. So think about the things, what are the things I like to do? What are my jobs that I actually enjoy? What are the things that I'm willing to do? And what are the things that I dread and I hate doing? Any of those things, that's your body telling you something. Can we give some of those things up? Can we reshift things? Maybe the people in your life are doing some things that they hate that you'd love, right? <clears throat> if you're somebody who loves folding laundry and your partner does the laundry, say, listen, you wash it, I'll fold it. All of a sudden, you, you're both happier, right? It's working hard. It's, we're very good at working hard. What I like to say is let's be strategic. Let's work smart. And then last but not least, <clears throat> this idea that we have where we feel like we have to be okay. Now, this is, a, this is a very difficult thing for a lot of people to talk about, gifted or not, visionary or not, right? Right, right. There's this idea that we, we, we live in this solar bipolar world where we're either okay or we're not okay. But there's this giant area between them where you're allowed to not be okay and you're allowed to be okay in some areas of your life, in all areas of your life, or in one particular area of your life that feels really big, right? Right. You know, have you ever, if you've ever had a toothache, you probably know what I'm talking about. If you have a toothache, that's all you can think about, right? right. And it doesn't matter if it's a beautiful sunny day and you just got a raise and your kids actually napped and the traffic was great on the, on the all you're thinking about is ow, 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 ow. ow. And some people will, will drop you that toxic positivity, right? That, well, everything in your life is going well. You should be happy. And we talked about shoulds yesterday, right? It's a thing. You could be happy, but right now there's this thing that's in the way. It's okay that it's in the way and it's okay that you're upset about it. But the trick is to take that emotional energy and turn it into action. Do you want to sit there and be miserable? I don't think many people do. So we say, okay, here I am being miserable. How much time would I get back if I did something about it? How much time would I get back if I said, let me call my dentist, right? And my dentist can see me on Thursday. Then on Thursday, they're going to take care of this for me, right? So it's acknowledging the emotion that you're feeling is going to free you to turn that emotion into action. But we need to acknowledge how we're feeling first. Oh, that, that's a really great strategy. And and I've noticed that with a lot of my clients too, is that whole loss of transition mm -hmm. and the loss of the, the separation and they are filling their time with more work. Yeah. 
or, or it was it was seductive to do that. And when I started pulling out that pointing out that seduction, then we started seeing like a lot of people settling down and doing better. And then their creativity started serving them. Where yeah. actually they've been they've been excelling during this quarantine time because they were able to get that seduction under control of work, 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 work. So their creativity could come in. And I think it's a very valuable point because not having transitions for any of us is, is dangerous. And it's super dangerous. It's very dangerous and, and lots of, lots of levels. That's a whole another podcast. <laughs> well, and if, if I could add one more thing about transitions. Sure. To, so to my friends in podcast land, life isn't going to give you the transitions back. I mean, maybe we return, maybe we reopen, but we are in this situation right now. So it's the sort of thing, promise yourself that you'll give yourself those transitions, even if it's five minutes. Even if, So if you're working from home and, you're sh and your shift ends at 4 p.m. and you know that your partner and your kids are downstairs waiting, do yourself, take five minutes. Take five minutes, read an article on Reddit scroll your Instagram feed, you take a five minute meditation, whatever it is that's going to feed your soul, because no life isn't going to show me like, Hey, I know you've been working really hard. So here's a half hour for you. It's, it doesn't work that way. We have to take it back. And it's okay that you do that. It's really okay that you give yourself that five minutes because these, these time limits we deal with are arbitrary. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. I get done with at work at 357 or 402. It's all arbitrary. Right. But you can tack on five minutes to that and do and breathe and take care of yourself and do that thing that's going to center you. Because we're, the world isn't going to give it back to us. So we have to claim it. And I think that's really important. Yes, I think it is very important. We have to we have to affect the change. We have to claim that time. Mm -hmm. And like you said, it's totally arbitrary. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, when I, when I used to drive to my office, which I, by my great intuition, or I don't know if it was a divine intervention or an accident, I don't know, but I started working from home and then doing home visits versus having my office in October. <laughs> wow. So I learned all of these things and it, it was set my business up. And then I started re having clients all over the country. Very, I only have two local people, the rest of my entire mm -hmm. people I serve are not even in Florida. Mm -hmm. And so it all, it all just divinely just, just happened. And wow. partly my intuition, partly chance, maybe luck. I don't know. Maybe it was all the guidance I didn't realize. I don't really know, but I know that it was perfectly positioned. So, but I had to learn those transitions once I started working from home all the time because I love to write, I love to create, I love to do this. And I'm like, whoa, 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 back it up, back it up. You are doing way, way, way more. And it was starting to not be fun. Yeah. And then the moment I said, okay, well, let's do fun things. This will all still be there. Now everything's fun again. But it, we have to be able to work with the timing and, and what's going on and claim that space. So the transitions are so important for everything. They're so important. Hmm. So I want to talk a little bit, and it kind of goes with the transitions actually, about neurodiversity. Okay. Um, you're an expert in that. You know a lot about it. And the reason why I want to bring it up is because it's, you know, it's one of those words that's like everybody's talking about the vagus nerve now. We've all always had vagus nerves and we all have always been needing to regulate. I thought regulate. we just found them just the other day, right? It's... <laughs> It's how it's sounding out there, you know, and I'm like, oh, my living word, you know, okay, fine. It's the new buzzword. Ooh. It's been in our bodies all along. And all of us who know have known about it have been talking about it all along. And so that's nice. And so neurodiversity, mm -hmm. people are now saying, well, this or that, and, and you're an expert in neurodiversity. And so yeah. I would like you to share a little bit about what that even is and why it's important. And if somebody's sitting down and they're thinking, wow, maybe I need to talk to somebody about this. If you're willing to do like virtual consults or whatever regarding these things, if you could share how you work a little bit around that, then that would give somebody an idea. Because I really think that there's people who have this issue and they don't see the gift in it yet because they don't even know what it is. They're right. just struggling silently. And I think the silent struggle is just damages so many people. So I'm hoping 
what you say can kind of shed some light for some people and maybe give them an avenue to, to start finding a solution. For sure. Um, okay. So neurodiversity is, is best described as we used to think that if you can visualize the normal curve, right, that 68% of people are, in, are in, within one standard deviation of what we consider normal or average, right? And then if we go out to a second standard deviation, that is 96% of people who have a normal-ish brain. And for a long time, we thought normal equals good, right? And what we found is that while, whereas more more people have that sort of neurotypical brain, right? The, the people who have atypical brains are not worse, they're different. There is a wealth of diversity in how our brains process information, how we communicate and connect with others, how we self-regulate, how we store information, how we communicate information. These are all things that our brains can do differently. And so as we learn more about the brain and how it, how it manifests, how it shows up, we realize that it, it isn't so much, are you normal or are you not? It's what skills do you bring to the table? How does your brain do what it does? What parts does it do well? What parts does it do poorly? Because when we think, when we zoom out and we see things that from a broad perspective, we get to turn up the volume on the things that you do well. And turn, and turn down the volume or give supports for the things you don't do so well. And that's a powerful thing because really neurodiversity is, a, is about accepting and valuing people where they are on this big diverse spectrum rather than saying, oh, normal's here, you're over here, so I'm gonna shove you over here so you're like everybody else because we don't want you to be like everybody else. You know, we want, to turn up the volume on the things that you're awesome and special at while making sure that you can follow enough of the rules to get by, right? And I work with some amazing neurodiverse people whose brains can do things I cannot even fathom. And I, I often tell the story of this, of this young man I work with. Uh, he's nine years old and he's doing college level calculus. Now I couldn't do college level calculus when I was in college. So I, this already, he's over my head. Right. And, and his family came to me and they said, you know, this is what we want to do. We want to help him understand that he's not weird. And I said, well, he is weird because if we took all of the nine year olds who do college calculus and put them in a room, there'd probably be room for a bouncy house, right? There's not a, a lot of nine year olds who can do college calculus. But weird doesn't mean bad. We don't want him to be normal because that would look like telling him to shh, quiet down, all that stuff about math. And you work on four times four is 16. When he's seeing, you know, multivariate calculus and nonlinear geometry and things that I don't know the words for, right? So let's accelerate that. But we also were able to accommodate the parts that his neurodiverse brain wasn't so good at, right? He had a lot of trouble with, like a lot of profoundly gifted kids with gym class, catching balls, running, uh, following the rules. That was really hard for him. And he would say things to me like, Dr. Matt, how is it I'm so good at math and so bad at gym? Like, why is that my life? And I said, I can help you with gym. I can teach you how to catch a ball. I can't teach you how to do multivariate calculus, but the good thing is you already know how to do that. So let me prop up the stuff you need some help with. And let's let you soar in the areas that you're excelling in because that's just part of your diverse set of skills. That's part of who you are. That isn't good or bad. We meet our clients, we meet our people, we meet each other where, they are, where we are. And then we march forward from there. And if we do so from a strength-based perspective, valuing the things we bring to the table, then we're gonna move forward intentionally towards success. Um, you know, and if you're somebody who's sitting out there and you think there's this one weird thing about me, right? You know, I'm somebody who can, you know, whenever there's a problem at work, they call me to fix it. Or, you know, I'm somebody who, for whatever reason, I can just pick up other languages. Or I'm somebody who, you know, 
likes to watch YouTube videos on how to fix cars. And by the way, I just complete, I just, uh, you know, rebuilt a Shelby Cobra in my garage this weekend. If you do something that when you tell other people that you do that thing and they go, wait, what? That's a great sign that you're a hidden gifted. It's a great sign that you have this neurodiversity and you've probably struggled for it because neurodiverse people don't operate on the same wavelength as neurotypical people. We can fake it, we can accommodate, we can, you know, some of my gifts are in the social and interpersonal world. I'm very good at matching where other people are, but I have neurodiverse friends that are like, I'm up here all the time. So when I'm with them, I have to go up there, right? They can't do that as well. And that's okay because this is where we get back to that idea of community we talked about yesterday. Finding the right community that's gonna value the things you do where it's not that weird, where you feel more supported and seen, then that difference feels less toxic. It feels less important. It isn't a scarlet letter. It's just, this is how my brain works. When we think about it, this is how my brain works. We make it about a biology thing. That's some sort of personality failing. If you have a friend or a loved one who's lactose intolerant, and I have friends and loved ones who are lactose intolerant, you don't yell at them for being lactose intolerant, right? How dare your small intestine not process lactose properly? That would be a ridiculous thing to say, but that's, that's, gas, that's digestive diversity, right? That's just a thing your body doesn't do as well as some other bodies. Okay, cool. We're going to feed you more roughage, and we're going to make sure you have some lactate, and that's how we accommodate that. It's really no different, but because our brains run everything, we feel those differences more. Yes, that and it and it's coming from a place I think of really appreciating all the diversity and mm -hmm. seeing the value in it, and um, and it's so refreshing because so many people look at those things as what's wrong with me, and right. and and even other professionals in the field I that I that I talk to, they'll say, well, what's wrong with them, and this is what's wrong with them, and I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa back up, what's right with them? And if we step into what's right and what's working and what's the natural thing, then we can get support on the other stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, it's always out there. And so it's so refreshing to hear you say it this way, because I mean, I, in my professional world here where I have been, um, have had to really get some distance from some people who, who still hold on to the idea that it's what's wrong with people. And yeah. we have to tell them, if we keep talking about what's wrong, we're going to figure out what's right. And I'm like, you can't, that doesn't work. Yeah. You can't talk about what's wrong in order to get to what's right. It doesn't work. That, yeah. that model doesn't work. So I don't, I don't use it. And so some people look at me and say, I've, I've been called everything from a voodoo witch priestess to, mm -hmm. uh, what was it? Well, that was really kind of funny. Cause I'm like, really? No, I don't think so. And then the one person looked at me and goes, you know, those envelopes where people say they're pushing envelopes. I go, yes. He goes, you don't even have an envelope, do you? <laughs> I well, said, yeah. right. Yes, that's, that's correct. Cause that, I love the diversity and I always have. And so I was so happy when people started really talking about it. Cause I think I was tuning into this before it was a known thing before the people were talking about it. And, you know, because when, when people started talking about it, I, it was ringing really true for my being like, oh, that's what I'm seeing in, in me and in other people that I'm really appreciating. Now it's got a word. Yeah, it's got a, we have, a, <laughs> there's so much power for naming something, right? Right. And knowing that's a thing, you know, and when we talk about neurodiversity and exceptionalism and, you know, and visionary and people who are visionaries, when they realize there is a word, a term, a community around these ideas, I've seen people burst into tears. It's like, wait, there's a word for this? Yes. Um, yeah, there is. And and welcome, my friend, right? Right. Pull up a chair. You know, you can, you can, if you want to talk about Dungeons and Dragons, you found your people to talk about Dungeons and Dragons with. You don't need to hide. And, you know, this idea of leading with strength, the system is not built for that right? The system is about teaching to the middle and training to the middle because that's where the most of the people are. So let's acknowledge that that's what works for most people. If you're listening to this podcast, you are probably not most people. Congratulations. You're one of us. Like I said, come on in. We've got chips. Um, and I was in a meeting once with a very 
well-respected school psychologist in this very wealthy district. And he looked at me and he said, you have to understand if we only talk about this kid's strengths, what's gonna happen? And I said, they'll feel better about themselves. And it was this moment where it's like, boom, everyone sort of stared at me like, and then awkward sounds. I said, because isn't that why we're all here? Mm -hmm. If we lead with strengths, you know, a rising tide lifts all boats. You let a kid who's eight years old who can do brilliant art, do brilliant art, they're gonna feel better about themselves, they're gonna do better in school, they're gonna make more friends. And then all the things we're worried about, the behaviors, the problematic feelings, all the things will be dragged upwards by the pure power of their exceptionalism. And then we all win. Isn't that great? If, a kid, if you have something exceptional about you, I want that on a t-shirt. I want that in the front of your LinkedIn page. I want that hashtag, whatever that is, that's awesome about you. Because that thing is special and wonderful. And we want that to drive the bus. Not this but language, right? Not this, oh, I mean, yeah, I've written three sonatas by time I was 20, but I, I'm not very good at gym class. Unless you're playing sonata ball, I don't care. I, it is much more important to me that you can write three sonatas than you cannot kick a soccer ball. I can teach you to catch, kick a soccer ball. But in the first thing, they're not even related. Our things we worry about do not undercut the things we're good at. They are a separate thing, and that's okay. Oh, that's genius. I could talk to you forever about it because there's so much alignment in the way we see things. And mm -hmm. And it's like, the podcast is called Someone Gets Me. And I'm sitting here going, someone gets me. <laughs> someone gets me. <laughs> you know, and, and because it's so important, I think, you know, and, and, and you addressed what, when, what I wanted to kind of close with. And that is looking forward and looking into the future and, and having hope, you know, like, and, and I, I believe that it's the gifted neurodiverse visionary types that are here on earth right now to bring in the new world. Yes. And for us to not shine our light and not be that, whatever that strength is, is that's where the crime is. That's where the suffering is. That's what is totally going against our purpose for being here. And I, and I thoroughly believe that. And I've, you know, I tell everybody, you're, you're what we've been looking for. Like yeah. we're here, we're, we're the group. So let's like step into it instead of hiding. And so you're speaking to that and, and obviously you have the same kind of belief I do about it. I sure like to think so. <laughs> yeah. And so good things are happening. So if you love everything that Dr. Matt's saying, like I have been, then contact him Yes. through Facebook or his website. All the contact information will be in the show notes. Mm -hmm. And you do work with pre people virtually, right? I do. Um, yeah, we have a, we've, we've built this really lovely uh, series of systems to meet people from actually, frankly, all over the world. We, um, I've been able to consult with people from Taiwan and the Netherlands and Australia and all over the U S and Canada, um, you know, and you know, whatever role I could play in your life, even if it's as simple as, Hey, I heard you on that podcast. Is the stuff you're talking about true? I can say yes here are more resources. And by the way, the people who are like you in where you are, are right here. Here's that information in an email. Then you talk to me once, you talk to me every day for two years, whatever that thing ends up being, we can co-create the role that all of us play in this, in this life. Because this isn't, a, this isn't an exclusive club. This is a welcoming community and we want you we want you in with us. We have plenty of seats, right? Mm -hmm. So please reach out, you know, on the website, on the different message groups, on social media. We are here to welcome you. Yes. So take him up on his invitation. Please. No matter where you are. Yeah. Um, because it's, if anything he said in either of these episodes has sung to you in a way or touched you, even if you don't know why, and especially if you don't know why, contact Dr. Matt because he will obviously be able to, to support you in a way that serves you moving forward through this really wild time that we're all going through. So take him up on the offer. Okay.
So all of his contact information will be in the show notes. One last question. Ready. There's a billboard and you're going to put a message on it. The whole world's going to see it. What's it say? The whole world's going to see this billboard. Okay. I'm going to say this. Act as though what you do makes a difference because it does. It's from William James, the founder, the godfather of American psychology. And it is, it's on the banner on my website. And it's the thing, it's when I wake up in the morning, that's what I think. What I do matters. So let me act in that way. Oh, that is perfect. So thank you. Matt, Thank for being on, on the show with us. Thank you for taking another hour of your time and um, blessing us with so much information. This will be one of those episodes to listen to more than once, as is the last one. So thank you very much for your time. Well, and thank you again for creating this kind of space for us to talk about these sort of things. It's, you know, I mean, you're, the way your beautiful mind works is just, it's a treat to experience. So I, it's, been, it's been wonderful sitting in this chair as well. Oh, great. Thank you so much. That's so kind of you. So remember, everybody, to keep your face to the sun so those shadows fall behind you because you're a rock star. Go out there and let your light shine and allow people to support you and allow yourself to thrive in your gifts. Until the next episode of Someone Gets Me, be well. Take care, everybody.